Hello, I'm Professor Praza, and today's lecture video covers the macronutrients. We will be discussing lipids. These are the specific learning objectives for this module. This module also meets the following course learning objectives. Lipids are a family of organic compounds that are mostly insoluble in water. Lipids include fats and oils, or triglycerides, phospholipids, waxes, and sterols. We are going to focus on triglycerides, phospholipids, and sterols primarily. Waxes are esters made of long chain alcohol and a fatty acid. They provide protection, especially to plants, in which wax covers the leaves of plants. In humans, cerumen, also known as earwax, helps protect the skin of the ear canal. Triglycerides are the main form of lipids in the body and in foods. The structure of a triglyceride is that it has a glycerol backbone and three fatty acids attached to it. Naturally occurring triglycerides are found in many foods, including avocado, olives, corn, nuts, butter, milk, and more. Most lipids in the diet are in the form of triglycerides. Many people refer to triglycerides in foods as fats or oils. Fats are normally solid at room temperature, where oils are generally liquid. A monoglyceride contains glycerol with one fatty acid attached, and a diglyceride would have two attached. Besides foods, we can also make triglycerides in our body from excess carbohydrates, fats, or proteins. Your body changes these extra calories into triglycerides and stores them in fat cells. There are different types of fatty acids, and triglycerides can contain a mixture of them. Fatty acids are classified by their carbon chain length and degree of saturation. Fatty acids have different chain lengths, typically between 4 and 24 carbons, and most contain an even number of carbon atoms. Long chain fatty acids are straight chain fatty acids containing 12 or more carbon atoms. Examples of long chain fatty acids include oily, cold water fish. Medium chain fatty acids are saturated or unsaturated fatty acids. Lastly, short chain fatty acids are a subset of fatty acids that are produced by the gut microbiota during fermentation of the partially and non-digestible polysaccharides. Short chain fatty acids can be made from all carbohydrates, but mainly from prebiotic dietary fibers that fuel the activities of beneficial bacteria. The term saturation refers to whether the carbon atom in a fatty acid chain is filled or saturated to capacity with hydrogen atoms. In a saturated fatty acid, each carbon is bonded to two hydrogen atoms with single bonds between the carbons. Alternatively, fatty acids can have points where hydrogen atoms are missing because there is a double bond between carbons. This is referred to as a point of unsaturation because the carbon is only bonded to one hydrogen atom instead of two. Unsaturated fatty acids have one or more points of unsaturation or double bonds between carbons. Monounsaturated fats have one double bond in their chain and polyunsaturated fats have two or more double bonds. Triglycerides contain a mixture of saturated, monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated fatty acids. However, they are classified by which is the most prominent. Let's take a closer look at saturated fats. Saturated fats are solid at room temperature, largely due to the lack of double bonds in the carbon chain of fatty acids, which makes them very straight. Examples of saturated fat sources include butter, coconut oil, cheese, beef, lamb, and palm oil. Although there is some newer research out there saying saturated fats may not be as harmful as once thought, research still shows there's a decrease in heart disease risk when replacing saturated with unsaturated fats. With that, the American Heart Association recommends limiting saturated fatty acids to 5-6% to of calories. It is important to note that the types of foods used to replace saturated fat affect the risk of heart disease. Just reducing saturated fat alone did not have a direct reduction on stroke risk. Replacing saturated fats with processed carbs does not clearly reduce cardiovascular disease risk. Some evidence has shown that replacing saturated fats with plant sources of monounsaturated fats, such as olive oil and nuts, may be associated with a reduced risk of cardiovascular disease. An article published in the Journal of Annals of Nutrition and Metabolism stated, In conclusion, strong evidence supports the partial replacement of saturated fatty acid-rich foods with those rich in cis polyunsaturated fatty acids to lower LDLC and reduce coronary heart disease risk. 
Also, the food matrix plays a major role. What this means is that what else the food is composed of, like proteins, fibers, and micronutrients. Dairy products, for example, contain minerals such as calcium and magnesium and have probiotic features if fermented, whereas processed red meat has this high salt and preservative content. Unsaturated fats include monounsaturated and polyunsaturated. Fat sources rich in unsaturated fatty acids tend to be liquid at room temperature because the carbon-carbon double bonds create bends in the carbon chain, making it harder for fatty acids to pack tightly together. Both polyunsaturated and monounsaturated can reduce the risk of heart disease and stroke. Monounsaturated fats include sources like olive oil, canola oil, peanut butter, avocado, nuts, and seeds. Polyunsaturated include sources like corn oil, sunflower oil, walnuts, soybeans, and tofu. Polyunsaturated fats also include omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. Omega-3 and omega-6 are essential, which means we need to obtain from food since our body cannot make them. Omega-3s have been found to reduce triglycerides and slow the buildup of plaque in the arteries. There are three main omega-3s, ALI, EPA, and DHA. ALA is primarily in plant oils, and DHA and EPA are found in cold water fish and other seafood. EPA and DHA have been shown to help reduce blood triglycerides and blood pressure, reduce inflammation, and prevent blood clot formation. They also promote hormonal normal growth and development in infants, especially in the development of the brain and the eyes. Both of these important omega-3s can be synthesized in the body from ALA, so they are not considered essential fatty acids. However, the rate of conversion of ALA to these omega-3s is limited. There is much more emphasis on omega-3s because omega-6s are easier to find in the U.S. food supply, with corn and soybean oil being common ingredients. A true essential fatty acid deficiency is rare in the developed world, but it can develop usually in people who eat very low-fat diets or have impaired fat malabsorption. Symptoms include dry and scaly skin, poor wound healing, increased vulnerability to infections, and impaired growth in infants and children. Trans fats are made when liquid oils are turned into solid fats, which are called partially hydrogenated oils. There are naturally occurring trans fats produced in the gut of some animals, but artificial trans fats or trans fatty acids are those created in a process where hydrogen is added to liquid vegetable oils, which makes them more solid. Hydrogenation, which is this process of adding hydrogen to the carbon-carbon double bonds, creates both saturated and trans fatty acids. Trans fats were used in the food supply to give food a more desirable taste and texture. They also allow oils to be more stable and less likely to go rancid. Trans fats are recommended to be avoided because they raise your LDL cholesterol and lower the HDL cholesterol. This increases the risk of heart disease and stroke. There is no safe amount of trans fats and there's no need to consume them, only risk. Phospholipids. There are major membrane lipids that can be synthesized by the body. They are similar in structure to a triglyceride, however, the glycerol backbone has two fatty acids instead of three and a phosphate group. The structure of a phospholipid is important as it makes them fat and water soluble. The fatty acid tail is hydrophobic, meaning disliking water, and the phosphate group and glycerol are hydrophilic, meaning attracted to water. Phospholipids play an important role in transporting fats in the blood, which we will cover later in this lecture. Cells in your body are encased in a membrane composed primarily of a double layer of phospholipids known as the phospholipid bilayer. This bilayer protects the inside of the cells and allows for transport of fat and water through the membrane. The tails, which are hydrophobic, form the interior of the membrane and the polar heads contact the fluid outside and inside of the cell. Phospholipids also act as emulsifiers. With an emulsifier, oil and water, for example, can stay mixed with oil being dispersed as tiny droplets throughout the water. Without an emulsifier, the oil and water would be separated into two layers. Lecithin is a phospholipid found in egg yolks, soybeans, and wheat germ. It is often used as an emulsifier in food as it allows for a smoother texture and, again, prevents the oil and water from separating. Lecithin is something you could see in salad dressings to allow for consistent creamy texture. 
cholesterol. This is a sterol that is synthesized by animal cells and also produced by the liver. It is a waxy, fat-like substance that is needed for building cells, making vitamins, and making hormones. You can find cholesterol in animal products like meat, eggs, and dairy. While cholesterol is important to the function of the body, we can synthesize all the cholesterol we need. The Dietary Guidelines for Americans 2020 to 2025 recommend that dietary cholesterol be as low as possible. The concern with too much cholesterol is that too much of it can lead to fatty plaque build and buildup in the arteries, narrowing of the arteries, and block blood flow. This happens when cholesterol joins with other substances and forms thick, hard deposits. We've reviewed some of the functions of different lipids. Most fats can be synthesized by the body from other macronutrients like carbohydrates and proteins. Let's review a few more of the functions that fats have in the body. Lipids are an important depot for energy storage. They offer insulation and protection and also help to regulate hormones. Lipids can serve as a larger and more long-term energy reserve as fats can be packed tightly together without water for a greater amount of energy in a smaller space. Fat cells are able to expand almost indefinitely in size. Although we do need some fat in the body for health and survival, large quantities can be damaging to health. Some of the fat stored in the body is within the abdominal cavity, and this is called visceral fat. Visceral fat helps to protect the heart, kidneys, and liver. Fat stored just beneath the skin is called subcutaneous fat. Subcutaneous fat insulates the body and keeps us warm. Adipose tissue also secretes leptin, which is a hormone that signals the body's energy status and helps regulate appetite. Consuming dietary fat helps to contribute to satiety, which is the feeling of being full. In the first lecture, we discussed the fat-soluble vitamins A, E, D, and K. The dietary fats consumed in foods aid in the transport of these fat-soluble vitamins and increase their bioavailability. Also, many foods that contain fat also contain these fat-soluble vitamins, like peanuts or avocado, for vitamin E. We discussed omega-3 fatty acids and omega-6 fatty acids earlier, and these are also essential for regulating blood clotting and controlling inflammation. Fats also play important functional roles in sustaining nerve impulse transmission, memory storage, and tissue structure. Now that we've covered what fats are and their benefits, let's review how they're digested and absorbed in the body. In the mouth, lingual lipase, an enzyme, is released along with a small amount of phospholipids as an emulsifier, which starts the process of breaking down triglycerides. Fats start to become tiny droplets and separate from watery components. Once in the stomach, the mixing and churning motion helps to disperse food particles and fat molecules. Gastric lipase is secreted, which contributes to the further breakdown of triglycerides to diglycerides and fatty acids. Not much in terms of digestion of lipids really happens in the stomach. Most occurs in the small intestine. In the stomach, fat mostly floats on the top of the watery contents. Once in the small intestine, most of the lipids are still undigested and clustered together. The pancreas secretes pancreatic lipase, which further breaks down triglycerides to fatty acids, monoglycerides, and some free glycerol. Bile, which is made in the liver and stored in the gallbladder, is released in the duodenum. Bile helps to emulsify fats, which means basically breaking apart the large fat droplets into smaller ones. Emulsification makes lipids more accessible to digestive enzymes by increasing the surface area for them to act. Bile is reabsorbed in the ileum of the small intestine and sent back to the liver to be used again in digestion. When less bile is recycled and instead eliminated in the feces, this means more needs to be taken out of the blood to restore the bile supply, which helps to decrease blood cholesterol levels. Once inside the intestinal cells, monoglycerides and fatty acids reassemble into triglycerides. Short and medium chain fatty acids and glycerol can be directly absorbed in the bloodstream. But triglycerides, cholesterol, and fat-soluble vitamins need to be transported. This is done through what's called chylomicrons, which we will review next. By the time we get to the large intestine, less than 5% of fat remains, and this is then excreted from the body via the feces. Chylomicrons are large structures with a core of triglycerides and cholesterol and an outer membrane made up of phospholipids interspersed with proteins called apolipoproteins and cholesterol. 
The outer membrane of phospholipids allows for them to be water soluble and travel in the bloodstream. Chylomicrons are just one type of lipoprotein. While all lipoproteins have the same basic structure and contain the same four components, different types of lipoproteins vary in the relative amounts of the four components in their overall size and in their functions. Chylomicrons are the least dense because they mostly contain triglycerides and little protein. On the other hand, high density lipoproteins are the most dense with more protein and less triglycerides. Chylomicrons transport fats to specific destinations in the body, like the liver and the tissues. After about 10 hours of circulating in the body, chylomicrons gradually release their triglycerols until all that remains is the cholesterol-rich remnant. The contents of the chylomicron remnants, as well as other lipids in the liver, are incorporated into another type of lipoprotein called the very low-density lipoprotein, or VLDLs. VLDL's main job is to deliver triglycerides to the body cells. As triglycerides are removed from the VLDL, they get smaller and more dense because they now contain relatively more protein compared to triglycerides. They become intermediate density lipoprotein, or IDLs, which are rich in cholesterol. These IDL particles are pro-atherogenic. Derived from the VLDLs and IDLs are low-density lipoproteins, or LDLs. The main job of LDL is to deliver cholesterol to the body cells. LDL carries the majority of the cholesterol that is in circulation. High-density lipoproteins, or HDLs, are made in the liver and the gastrointestinal tract. They're mostly made up of proteins, so they're very dense. Their job is to pick up cholesterol from the body cells and return it to the liver for disposal. HDL has been considered the good cholesterol or good cholesterol transporter because it scavenges cholesterol, including LDL lodged in the arterial walls and helps to remove it from the body. HDL particles have antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, anti-thrombotic, and anti-apopotic properties, which may also contribute to their ability to inhibit atherosclerosis. A lipid panel is a standard blood test that can provide information about risk of developing cardiovascular disease. The only way to know if you have high cholesterol would be with a blood test. When looking at blood cholesterol levels, greater than 200 mg per deciliter indicates high cholesterol. Optimal total cholesterol would be about 150. For LDL or the bad cholesterol, optimal is about 100. For HDL, optimal would be about 40 in men and 50 in women. Lastly, optimal triglycerides would be less than 150. With LDL and HDL cholesterol, really they are transporters more than anything else. They are lipoproteins that carry cholesterol. If there's too much LDL in the blood, this can become lodged in the arterial walls, reducing the flow of blood and leading to atherosclerosis. Some physicians might run additional blood tests to measure LDL particle size along with the number of LDL particles. Smaller LDL particles are more strongly associated with risk of cardiovascular disease than large LDL particles. Let's review recommendations for dietary lipids. The AMDR for fat is 20 to 35% for adults. As a reminder, the emphasis is on consuming polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fats. The Dietary Guidelines for Americans recommends less than 10% of calories from saturated fat and the American Heart Association recommends less than 6%. Trans fats are recommended to be zero. Previously, the 2015 to 2020 DGAs recommended limiting cholesterol to 300 milligrams. However, the new guidelines warn against consuming cholesterol without a specific target. We've talked a bit about heart disease already, but let's look at what that entails. Heart disease is a group of conditions with the most common type being coronary artery disease. Coronary artery disease affects the blood flow to the heart and can lead to a heart attack. Many of the issues that lead to heart disease include atherosclerosis, a type of arteriosclerosis, which is when plaque builds up, thickens, and stiffens the artery walls. The deposits are composed of cholesterol, fatty substances, and cellular waste products like calcium and fibrin. This can inhibit blood flow as the arteries become more narrow and less elastic. The narrowing of the artery means less oxygen and other nutrients are being distributed. Coronary artery disease is when plaque builds up in the arteries, 
in or leading to the heart. Carotid artery disease is when plaque builds up in the neck arteries, which supply blood to the brain. Peripheral artery disease is when plaque builds up in the arteries of the extremities, especially the legs. Eventually, a clot or spasm can occur in this plaque-clogged artery. If a broken piece of plaque or blood clot completely blocks an artery supplying the brain or the heart, it can cause a stroke or heart attack. A heart attack, which is also referred to as a myocardial infarction, occurs when part of the heart muscle does not get enough blood. One of the main causes of heart attack is coronary artery disease. Symptoms of a heart attack can include chest pain or discomfort, feeling weak, lightheaded, or faint, pain or discomfort in the jaw, neck, back, arms, or shoulders, and shortness of breath. A stroke can occur when there's a loss of blood flow to part of the brain. Within a few minutes, the brain cells will start to die without oxygen and nutrients. This can lead to brain damage or even death. There are two types of stroke, ischemic and hemorrhagic. Ischemic stroke, which is the most common, is caused by a blood clot that plucks or plugs a blood vessel in the brain. Hemorrhagic stroke is caused by a blood vessel that breaks and bleeds into the brain. A transient ischemic attack is similar to a stroke and often referred to as a mini stroke. There's a blockage of the blood supply to the brain for a short period of time. Damage typically isn't permanent for the brain cells, but this does put someone at much higher risk of having a stroke later. Quick action is critical for a stroke as time lost means the brain is lost. If you think someone is having a stroke, call 911 immediately and act fast. This acronym stands for face, arms, speech, and time. Face, ask the person to smile and see if one side of the face droops. Arms, ask the person to raise both arms to see if one arm drifts downward. Speech, ask the person to repeat a simple phrase to see if the speech is slurred or strange. Time, if any of the signs are present, call 911 and note the time when the symptoms first appeared. Let's talk about risk factors associated with heart disease. The American Heart Association separates risk factors into modifiable, or those that can be changed or influenced, and non-modifiable, or those that cannot be changed. Non-modifiable includes increasing age, especially those over the age of 65. Men also have a greater risk of heart disease than women. And lastly, heredity, as family history increases the risk of heart disease, especially if it was a parent. As for modifiable, this includes not smoking, as tobacco is a major risk factor for heart attack and stroke, elevated blood cholesterol and blood pressure, which increase the risk along with diabetes and obesity. The higher your blood pressure levels, the more risk you have for other health problems, such as heart disease, heart attack, and stroke. Managing diabetes, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia would be key in reducing the risk of heart disease. Let's review some general guidelines for preventing and managing heart disease. First is to limit sodium, added sugars, and saturated fats. Foods that are higher in saturated fats are often high in cholesterol as well. Aim for replacing high saturated fat sources with unsaturated fats like olive oil, avocado, and nuts. Trans fats, again, do not provide any benefit, only harm. Increasing fiber intake can help with reducing cholesterol in the body and reducing levels of LDL cholesterol and triglycerides. Soluble fiber in particular can be effective in reducing cholesterol reabsorption in the blood. Physical activity can help with maintaining a healthy weight and lowering blood cholesterol and blood pressure. The Surgeon General recommends 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise per week for adults. Not smoking or quitting smoking is another way to reduce your risk of heart disease. Smoking, like we mentioned earlier, damages your blood vessels and also increases the rate at which your, heart, your arteries harden. Limiting alcohol is another lifestyle change that can reduce your risk of heart disease. Too much alcohol increases cholesterol levels and triglycerides. Lastly, checking in with your healthcare provider regularly to get a physical and labs to catch any risk factors earlier rather than later.